Welcome to the Ask Your Mentor podcast from Dementia Researcher and Alzheimer's Research UK, where mentees interview their mentors to hear about their careers, experiences, and to find out what makes them tick. Hello, and welcome to Ask Your Mentor, the show that promises to bring you a spark of scientific knowledge, a sizzle of career insights, and a whole lot of brain power. I'm Shania Ibarra, and I'm a research assistant at the ARUK Oxford Drug Discovery Institute, and my current work focuses on discovering small molecules that modulate the neuroinflammatory pathway as a therapeutic strategy for Alzheimer's disease. In this show, we have a remarkable guest joining us, my amazing mentor, Dr. Aitana Sogord Esteve. Hello. 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 Um, armed with a PhD and more accolades than you can shake a pipette at, my mentor may herself still be classified as an early career researcher, but what truly sets her apart is her unwavering commitment to guiding the next generation of curious minds. Aitana and I were matched through the ARUK Mentoring Programme, a great free scheme that recognizes the importance of mentoring and providing strong support systems. Delivered as part of their new ECR program, it pairs people working at all career stages and matches people according to their needs. So keep an eye on their website for the next round. As regular listeners will know, in these shows, we delve into the fascinating journey of our mentor's career, unearthing valuable lessons, hard-earned wisdom, and the occasional anecdote. So grab your lab notebooks and get ready to be enlightened, motivated, and even have a eureka moment or two as we explore the remarkable insights and tips shared by Aitana. So Aitana, can you please take us through your career so far? Well, yes. Um, so um, I'm, well, I'm Spanish uh, and I did my undergraduate in Spain at the University of Alicante. I studied biology degree. So back when I was at the university, the system was a bit different. So my degree was five years indeed. Uh, yeah, so they changed it a couple of years after um, I started, but I was one of the last uh, uh, runs of, of the long degree. Um, so after doing five years of biology, I was not very sure what to do, actually. Um, I Because uh, the city I'm from uh, is by the Mediterranean Sea. I've always been kind of very uh, in love with the, the sea and uh, and. Um, Mary, uh, like all this science uh, around the, the sea and the oceans. So at the beginning, I thought that I wanted to be a marine biologist. But then when I when I was doing my uh, undergraduate, I had the opportunity to do another or one, one of the years is at another university. And I moved to Barcelona for one year. And uh, because I wanted to take the most of the experience, I decided to do different subjects that were not available at my university. So that's when I um, I, uh, I met the, the world of the neuroscience. <laughs> so I took a lot of uh, neurodevelopmental um, uh, and neurobiology subjects and I really fell in love with it. Uh, so then when I came back from Barcelona, I decided that maybe that was something that I would be passionate about as well. Um, so because I was not completely sure if I wanted to do a PhD or, or not, it was a big commitment. Um, I decided to do a master in neuroscience. And, uh, and I was so lucky that in uh, Alicante, there is one of the best uh, uh, neuroscience research centers in Spain. So that was very close to my place. Uh, I, I was close to my friends and my family. So it was not a big challenge for me. Um, and I studied one year master there and I had the, the opportunity to uh, start my master project in a laboratory which, which was working with, um, um, with um, nerve uh, terminals in the retina, retina, in the cornea. Uh, so I did a lot of electrophysiology recordings and I didn't like it at all. <laughs> so I think that was not for me. Uh, but the summer before, I did a very short summer internship in a laboratory, in a laboratory that was um, working on Alzheimer's disease, and I really enjoyed it. And and one day I was I was um, in the research center, and I and I um, and I found in the corridors my 
former supervisor from the summer internship and he told me well i have a research assistant job would you like to apply for that um if you are interested we will consider you so so then i got the job and uh, and then i changed my master project completely in the middle of the master <laughs> So, yeah, uh, it was a bit risky, but I managed to, to finish it. Um, so I asked for an extension of a couple of months. And uh, that's when I started my career in, in dementia, actually, because I, I started already working on free biomarkers and uh, underlying me mechanisms of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So then I, I was lucky enough to, to have funding for, for a PhD. It was not a fellowship, but my supervisor had funding. Uh, so then I continue my master project with the PhD and I finished my PhD in 2018. And um, at that point, I think it's still an issue now in Spain, the, the um, investment uh, and the resources and the funding in research is not very good. So the opportunities are, are very scarce actually um a lot of people recommended me that if i really wanted to pursue a career in academia and do research um a very good thing for me would be to go abroad um so i already uh i have already been abroad on my phd and i actually was in sweden in the, at the university of Gothenburg. Uh, so i already met the amazing henrik Settenberg, who is like a, a star in the, in the world of flea biomarkers um and uh, actually I, I emailed henrik a couple of times uh, asking if he had any postdoc positions available, um, I will be very interested, and he never replied. Uh, but I, I know he, I, I know him now for, for quite a long time. I know he's super busy, so I, it was expected that. Um, but then I was so lucky that just the week before my, my PhD Viva, he came to give a talk to my institute. So then, of course, I approached to him and said, nice to meet you. I work in this and I sent you a couple of emails. And then he was so nice and said, oh, oh don't worry, send me uh, an email again and send me your PhD manuscript if you want to. And I will have a look. And and then um, and then uh, I found uh, this position with him um, and another researcher at the UK Dementia Research Institute at UCL. So then I decided to move uh, to London. And uh, I've been at UCL since then, almost five years. Uh, in October will be five years since I, I've been working at UCL. And I've changed a little bit. My, fir my first postdoc was in Alzheimer's disease um, and I, it didn't went very well. Uh, so I decided to kind of change the best scenario, still working with Henrik, but I decided to, to move a little bit in the dementia field and work in front of temporal dementia, which was something that, um, that grabs my interest in the past few years. So yeah, now I'm a postdoc uh, at UCL. Uh, I'm a research fellow working in flu biomarkers for frontotemporal dementia. Um, and yeah, I think that might be, well, uh, should I mention, I think I might, I might need to mention that um, I have been super lucky in the past few years. And uh, I was awarded uh, this amazing Race Against Dementia Fellowship. I'm on my second year now, and I, I still can't believe that I was that, that lucky to get this fellowship because it's a really, really amazing, amazing program. I'm enjoying it very much. So um, it's, a, it's a very nice uh, team. It's a very nice environment and super good leadership, uh, training and development. And it's for five years. So I'm on my second year, so I still have three and a half years more to, to complete my project, which is a, a very good time frame and a very good amount of time and resources to be able to develop a project. So yeah, I'm uh, very happy right now, actually, in, in the state of my career. Wow. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, what an amazing journey you've had so far in so little time. Um, I kind of want to go back all the way yeah. to the very start. Um, so what was it about neuroscience that made you think, oh, this is actually what I'd rather do instead of marine biology? So I think um, uh, I, I've 
try to think about this quite a lot and never find the, the kind of the answer to that. I'm, I'm, I think that I, I really like the unknown. So in terms of the, the sea and the oceans, we don't know very little about that. So I think that's what it moved me. Um, and also because I'm kind of romantic in that, in that sense, I really miss uh, the Mediterranean Sea. And it's the first thing when, when I come back to Spain, the first thing I do is to go to the beach and it, winter, summer, doesn't matter. Uh, but um, I think it was that as well, right? About neuroscience, we know, I, I, I was just fascinated about um, how the brain works and how little we know about it and all the things that are happening and, and why is that happening and how come that makes us feel or like see uh, or speak, walk and being who we are, right? It's, again, I find, find it fascinating. So. Uh, so I think that's why I decided, and also because I I, I had this um, kind of this big chance, not chance, but this opportunity that one of the best neuroscience research centers was uh, where I'm from in Alicante. So that was also quite kind of convenient. But but yeah, I think it was more the unknown. And then I think uh, the the um, the decision to study uh, or kind of have my career in dementia instead of other aspects of neuroscience, which I found interesting as well. It's a, I think it's a bit of fear. Uh, so every time I think about dementia or I know someone, and fortunately I don't have anyone very close in my family, but I have some friends uh, and, and like um, fam like not very close family, but also family who have suffered from it. And it's so devastating. And I'm just, I think I'm so scared of that, that I really want to, to know more. So I think my solution when I'm scared about something is just like know more about it and try to learn as much as I can about it to understand why is this happening? What, what is that? So, so yeah, I guess that, that was the the reason why I decided to <laughs> to study this. I can totally relate to that. I think you know dementia takes away um, a lot of a person. Um, I would say that you know memories are very precious to all of us, and it's quite sad to see when um, people or individuals who suffer from dementia um, forget, like. The most important people in their lives and mm. you know forget uh, a big part of who they are as a person i think that's also one of the things that kind of drives me to um, do research in this field so i can totally relate to what you're saying right now mm. um so my next question would be about you know moving from spain to the uk i imagine that was quite um, a scary thing to do especially, you know, at such an early stage of your career, mm. uh, what would you say was the, the biggest challenge that you've um, had to face when you first moved to the UK? Well, well, I think it was a challenge, a big challenge itself. I, I've, uh, I'm from a relatively small city um, and uh, I I grew up with all my friends and all my family very close. Um, my mom has a very big family. They are seven siblings and, and we are 14 cousins. Um, and I'm the smallest one. Uh, so I, I always had all my family and all my friends very close, like in very like you can you walk five minutes and you are you can see all my family in my town. Um, so I think that was kind of the big challenge just to to kind of being aware away for that from that and also missing all the things that are happening because life does that doesn't stop right and my having these amazing exper experiences abroad but then then everyone is having their lives and then you expect when you come back that everything is as you left and it's not so that's something that um that the as i'm living abroad for longer, I realize more um, because you have this memory when we left 
when, when, when you left from the place you were before. Um, I think in the first weeks, um, an also big challenge was the language because, um, so in Spain, we don't have a very good uh, um, uh, English kind of uh, education. Uh, so we learn English at school, but uh, we, um, we translate everything. We translate all the films for the cinema and all the TV shows and everything. So we don't have this kind of input of listening English and, and so on. So even though I did my, my master in English, I did my, I wrote my master dissertation in English. I did my PhD in English. I did my Viva in English. Um, it's not the same. So I think for the first three weeks, the, uh, it took me, I, mean, it, I think it took me a, around three weeks to kind of click and start understanding everything that, that people were saying to me. And even though when I'm very tired right now, like even I have been living here for five years, if I'm really tired, sometimes I struggle to understand people because I have to think in two different languages or even to kind of say what I want to say because yeah, it's a, uh, um, but yeah, but I think moving to a different country, it's always a bit, a big challenge because at the beginning you are excited. You don't realize it because everything is new and it's a new experience. But, um, I was also, I didn't know anyone here in London. So for the first year and a half, it was a bit difficult. Uh, because London is a big city um, and that's good because you can meet a lot of people but it's also difficult to find your people your kind of you know the people that you do kind of match with and you can call friends and they can they become your family so I I had a bit of a hard time um, kind of accommodating to that um, and then yeah it's just like all the things that you miss and your family and you know your parents getting older your your grandparents uh, and you are not there um now i have a, a nephew and a niece and i'm missing them growing up or my friends children as well but but i think it's uh, at the end it's a balance right i'm uh, i'm I'm enjoying very much living abroad. I'm enjoying very much living here. Now I have kind of my small family here. I really like the research I'm doing at UCL. I really enjoy working at UCL. Now I have this Race Against Dementia Fellowship and all the things that I'm doing thanks to Race Against Dementia are invaluable. So, yeah. With regards to that, do you have any advice for any ECRs who are probably thinking about moving to another country um, for their research career? Like what sort of advice would you give to them? Well, I think uh, not to be afraid of it. It's, an, it's a great experience and, uh, and it, really, it really brings you a lot of things. You, you, grow, you grow up a lot when you, when you are, um, even though it's not moving far away. I mean, from Spain to the UK, it's not far away, but um, you can see the difference in the culture and, and you can learn a lot about that. So I think um, my advice would be just go for it and, and enjoy it because it's, it's really rewarding. You also mentioned that when you first started, you were working in um, Alzheimer's disease, but now you currently work in FTD. Mm -hmm. Um, could you give us um, more insight into why you moved to FTD? Well, I think I, it was not very meditated. It was uh, mostly for uh, availability of jobs and most uh, the, mostly the type of the job or the job description. Um, I, I wanted to, to work uh, on fluid biomarkers. I wanted to, to stay in the field of fluid biomarkers. And um, there's a, already a lot of people working in fluid biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. Um, but then in front of temporal dementia, I, it was quite unknown for me. Uh, I didn't know that much. Uh, so it was again this, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, when I don't know something, I really want to investigate a little bit more, right? So I readily, uh, I knew 
a bit about it, but I was also fascinated how complex it is, and uh, and I I found it super interesting as well. So then I saw that this job um, um, advert, and then I saw that it was free by markers as well. That we needed a postdoc to kind of also coordinate the team. So I was going to get involved in PhD supervision and also research assistant supervision. So that was also very attractive to me, just the, the fact of having my small team in which I can help to supervise and coordinate, but then being able to do my research and, um, and just bring in my ideas uh, of new projects and new things to do. Um, and then it was not staying in the same things that I was doing before. It was something new, which was frontotemporal dementia with new challenges, with, uh, with new things to learn. So yeah, I think it was a combination of, of a lot of different things. It was also in 2020, so I had my interview um, the day they were closing the borders. So yeah, so then uh, I started my 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 job um, in FTD in May 2020. So it was quite a bit strange because I was not able to meet in person my team for almost a year. So I started working with uh, with uh, this team, and I only knew like kind of a small <laughs> part of their bodies, basically. Um, so yeah, it, it has been interesting. <laughs> so for some of our listeners who might not know too much about FTD, can you just give us like a brief explanation of what it is? Yes. Uh, so frontotemporal dementia is uh, a rare type of dementia, so it's not as common of uh, Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia. Um, it has most of the times an earlier onset than AD, and um, and it's very, very complex. So frontotemporal dementia is it's an umbrella term uh, for different clinical manifestations. So the manifestations can be um, behavioral or in the behavioral FTD in which there is a change in personality of the patients, which is quite striking. Um, um, but also it can have, um, it can affect the, the ability to speak with the, what they are called primary progressive aphasias. Uh, so they affect the language. Um, and the ability to produce a speech or to understand what is being said or what is being told. Um, and it, also, it can also have a motor component. Um, frontotemporal dementia manifests um, often with a, a myotrophic lateral sclerosis. So it's uh, very, very complex. And, um, and then uh, on top of this, um, there are different underlying pathologies causing to frontotemporal dementia, and the underlying pathologies are not very linearly related to the clinical manifestations. So they are very heterogeneous. And then on top of this, we have an extra level, which is the genetics. So in frontotemporal dementia, uh, between 30 to 50 percent of cases are caused by a genetic mutation. In Alzheimer's disease, it's only it's a, very low. It's fifty to ten. Uh, sorry, five to ten percent. Um, so yeah, it's a very very complex disorder, um, and then it's uh, very challenging to diagnose, and therefore is it's extremely difficult to find therapies to target uh, FTD. That was very informative. Um, I mean, I myself don't know too much about FTD, but I learned a lot in that few minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you also mentioned that you're a Race Against Dementia fellow. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a bit more about the, the process of application for that fellowship? Because I guess um, it was highly competitive. Hmm. Yeah, so, so Race Against Dementia um, in the UK is, uh, uh, has a partnership with Alzheimer Research UK. Uh, so the way the applications have been working so far is the same way as when, when you apply for a fellowship for the same Research UK. So you have to write um, your application with your project. And, um, and it's quite a long application because you, you have to explain all the um, scientific context of your research or what you want to do. You have to explain very well the methodologies, but also the implications of your research. 
um, so you have to explain very in detail the project. You have to create a project. In this case, for residents, dementia is five years funding. So you have to kind of create a, an outline of all the different things that you are going to do, all the experiments, explain it very well. Um, and you send this application and then uh, this, uh, um, this project, your project is evaluated uh, by external reviewers. It's something similar to when you send the paper to, to a journal. So Alzheimer Research you have, UK have external reviewers who are experts in different fields and they kind of alloc allocate the applications depending on the expertise. So those external reviewers um, uh, do all the reviewing process of the scientific, that's the science and the experiments that, uh, that you propose to do in your project and they send you comments like in, in a paper review. Um, and then you have uh, some time to, to write the rebuttal to those comments. So you can see uh, and you can, uh, you can see the comments from the reviewers and then you write the response basically. Um, so then Alzheimer Research UK takes all of it together. Uh, so your project, the comments from the reviewers and your rebuttal. And then um, they have this uh, um, grand review board meetings uh, in which they meet and they review all the documents for all the grant applications. Uh, so then if you are selected um, and, uh, in this uh, grant review board, then you, you are basically shortlisted for an interview. And in my case, or in the case in the Race Against Dementia Fellowship, um, after the interview, you have a next step. So what uh, Race Against Dementia asked me to do was a video recording myself explaining my project um, uh, to a lay audience because um, the Race Against Dementia uh, charity has a board of trustees and they evaluate uh, all the applications that they receive and they evaluate them um, based on this on the video. So um, you have to explain very well um, what is what you are going to do, why is important, what you want to do. Um, and also, of course, why Race Against Dementia will be will be interested in that, right? Or how how will you benefit from Race Against Dementia? Uh, so then I was shortlisted for the interview. I did an interview with a panel of five um, researchers. Um, and then after I was shortlisted after the interview and then uh, Alzheimer Research UK sent my video to Race Against Dementia. So it was quite a long process, but it was quite, it was very, I think it was very fun. Uh, mostly doing the video was, was really fun. Um, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds very intense. <laughs> yeah, no, it was good. I enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what do you currently enjoy most about being a Race Against Dementia Fellow? Well, I think there are different, there are several things. So I think one thing uh, that Race Against Dementia provides you is kind of more the stability. You have five years. So that allows you to not to stress to apply for the next fellowship. You can apply uh, for other funding to support your project. But it also gives you the time and the resources to kind of be more risky on your research and try new things that otherwise, if you only have two or three years funding, you wouldn't try. And I really enjoy that. Um, I also enjoy very much um, the leadership program that they have. We have a lot of opportunities for training. We have trained, uh, we have been attending training of uh, public speaking or how to do a presentation to a lay, sound, uh, a lay audience um, and, um, and a lot of this different training. But I think uh, the coolest thing is the Formula One site. So I would never imagine in my life that I was going to visit the, the car uh, racing factories. I could see how they build the Formula One cars. Uh, I could attend uh, the Silverstone Grand Prix and see all the cars and everything. And you learn a lot. I've learned and I'm, I've been fascinated about um, how they work in the team, the mentality, the team mentality that they have, that everyone is important. 
all of them, they have to go together. And I think is that's a, a very good mindset. And that's something that in, in research we sometimes lack. There are a lot of competition for being the first to publish these or that. And, um, and I think that there, we need a little bit of change in our mindset and be more collaborative and more open to collaborations or to unite forces. Uh, together. So that's a very, very nice thing that I think the Formula One teams have. And then uh, another thing that I, I like and I enjoy um, is uh, uh, when I when I join this kind of events and, and Sir Jackie Stewart is around, I really like to see how everyone admires him. It's amazing. It's really, it's like, it's very, very like it's so genuine. Everyone loves him, and he is very caring about everyone. Um, so yeah, I really like that as well. Just being able to see that and and experience that, all the environment and the vibe surrounding these things. That's really cool. Um, I'm an F1 fan, so I'm quite jealous of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can apply for the when you finish your PhD for yeah. uh, for future um, runs. <laughs> Yep, in three, four years' time, I will think about it. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that you really like how collaborative um, these F1 teams are. Um, do you yourself have a lot of collaborations at the moment? Well, I'm, I have a, a long-standing collaboration with, with Sweden for, for the past years, thanks to, to Henrik. Um, and I collaborate with different people um, in the team in Gothenburg. Um, but yeah, I, I have also uh, uh, collaborations thanks to Race Against Dementia. So actually, um, one of the other Rad Fellows, Viola, uh, she's based in Cardiff, and we we decided to apply for a grant together, and uh, and we got it. So now we have a postdoc working with the two of us, and it's super super fun because uh, so all the Race Against Dementia fellows became my friends because we share a lot together. And, uh, and it's really fun to, to work with one of your friends and then, uh, and then have, have a post of working for the both of us and kind of mm, mixing or kind of uh, complementing our two projects. Um, yeah, I also have collaborations with Maura, who is another Race Against Dementia fellow and uh, across UCL as well. So yeah, it's not a lot of collaborations, but they are very fruitful, I think. That's amazing. Mm. Um, do you have any um, advice for people who might want to start looking into finding collaborators? Well, I think uh, it's a, I think it depends a lot of on the person. Um, for the first years, I I. I've struggled, uh, like when I was in my PhD, I didn't go to so many conferences and interact with uh, with a lot of researchers. Uh, so then I started struggling with this in my postdoc. Um, at the conferences, I find it very difficult and challenging to start talking to people. Um, so then I, I started to just kind of uh, setting myself small challenges. Like today, I want to talk to this person. So if I manage to talk to this person, then I will be happy. So don't overwhelm myself. So I think if you struggle with these things, setting a kind of a small goals, um, and then you will get there. And now when I go to a conference, it's like I introduce myself to everyone and I'm just out there and I surprise myself some days. Um, and yeah, I think uh, just be open. Uh, to ideas and and also be open to to what you have, what you can provide to the project, uh, what you expect. Just be very clear. I think that's very important when you want to to set up a collaboration, open and clear. Thank you. Those were some really nice practical tips um, <laughs> that I'll be making a note of for future reference. <laughs> Um, so you, you also mentioned that you are currently a coordinator for the fluid biomarker team at UCL. Um, what, what is that like? Well, so um, that was that was kind of the position I started now with the with the Race Against the Dementia Fellowship. I moved a little bit 
aside of that, but I'm still involved. So I I help the the um, I help the the PI, the principal investigator, to kind of uh, run the team, uh, the fleet by market team, because the big team uh, from from my supervisor is divided in small teams, and each of them have a different expertise. Uh, so we have the clinical team, the cognitive team, um, imaging team, and uh, and then the fluid biomarker bit, right? So most of the of the rest of the people in the team, they are uh, they don't have a kind of biology, biotechnology, or more like wet lab training, uh, fundamental science training. So um, I my my job is basically to help the PhD students and the research assistants in the wet lab to do the experiments and do the research and everything, and as a link to the supervisor, uh, to the PI. So I kind of help in the, the PI coordinating everything, all the projects and basically the, the um, kind of the point of, I don't know how to say this now, but basically I kind of help in the lab <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> What else have you learned from that role? Um, I'm guessing your leadership skills have mm -hmm. also improved from that, right? Yes, definitely, definitely. So I think it's uh, I learn a lot about uh, helping people in the lab and supervising. So I also like I really want to to be of help of people. So I've attended uh, I've attended a couple of trainings on leadership. Um, and I try to implement that, just being supportive, uh, because it's uh, you are kind of n nourishing the next generation of scientists, right? So mm -hmm. being supportive and uh, and being helpful, being there for them, um, guide them, but but let them be them. You know, you just have to to uh, help and push in their progress. Cool. Um, so I'm going to now round up this segment um, with one final question. Um, what is it that continues to motivate you to do the work that you do? And is there anything that you would have done differently, given um, how your career has turned out so far? Well, uh, I think what, what motivates me is basically I don't see myself doing anything else in my life. <laughs> So uh, I I really I, I love my job. I love being a researcher, and I enjoy it. I really I'm so happy the days I'm in the lab running experiments. Um, and in terms of something that I will have done differently, I really don't know because um, I think on when I did my PhD, uh, I will have enjoyed to be in abroad for a long time. It was just mm -hmm. the minimum. Um, because I couldn't afford to, to be more times. So maybe even being one year abroad will have been nicer. But in the end, it has worked at this stage. It has, it has worked quite nicely. So mm -hmm. I don't want to change anything in the past because I'm quite well where I'm right now. Yeah. <laughs> so now we know about your career. In the next part of the show, it's time to get some speedy career and life tips. These are quick fire questions. Are you ready? Okay, yeah, I'm ready. <clears throat> What's one thing you wish someone had told you when you were at the career stage I am currently? I would say be be open to to any opportunities and don't don't be scared of trying new things and new jobs. Nice. Um I think we touched upon this earlier, but collaboration and teamwork are crucial in the scientific community. What advice do you have about finding collaborators and how do you make those relationships work? Well, it's what I said before, right? I think it's very important to be clear and open on your uh, ideas or what you expect from them, what you can provide uh, to the collaboration. So being honest with your collaborators. Cool. Um, how important is science communications and how do you deal with nerves and prepare for public speaking? 
Well, I think it's it's very very important, and uh, and and I learned that here in the UK, in Spain, is not such a big thing, and I am a bit sad to think that because I will have enjoyed a lot all the public engagement events that are uh, available in the UK when I was at your stage. Uh, uh, um, I think it's practice. I was so scared of uh, doing a presentation when I started, when I was doing my PhD. Um, and now I think it's just like you, you win confidence because you own what you are presenting. So my advice is always, I always tell to, to PhD students and research assistants like you, you are presenting your work. So you know better than anyone what you have done. So you know what you, you have to say. It's, uh, it's uh, be confident on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, as a scientist, work-life balance can be challenging. How do you manage to find time for personal pursuits and maintain your well-being while pursuing your scientific endeavors? That's a very difficult question. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think I, I haven't been the best in that, not even good in that. Um, sometimes, uh, well, I had a very bad experience in the past with that, with my mental health. Um, mm -hmm. But I had to learn. So uh, I've, I've done a lot of therapy and I've learned a lot <laughs> from that. And I learned to listen to my body. I think it's very important to listen to your body. Um, and nothing is urgent. Like nothing is, you know, everything can wait. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just listen to your body is what I do now. Even though I have a deadline, I just try to say, okay, I have a deadline. I have to do this, but right now I can't. So I'm going to just stop for one hour, two hours, relax, disconnect completely. And mm -hmm. then, and then I will come back and, and I will be better. Yeah. <laughs> And then in terms of my personal life, I, I kind of, uh, I've always had it there that it's quite important for me. So mm -hmm. I always find, find time for, for that, to meet my friends or to, to do something with my partner, to go for a nice dinner, go for a walk. Um, for me, it's very important because it also gives me the mental health uh, support that I need to continue with the, with the workload that I have basically. Thank you. Um, how and where do you find inspiration in your research? Well, I look um, mostly to, to female researchers <laughs> and, uh, and young researchers. I, there are a lot of amazing uh, uh, women uh, doing research right now. And I just try to, to kind of follow them on social media, follow their research and attend to their talks. Uh, try to to network uh, uh, with them and try to kind of uh, have conversations with them. That's very very inspiring for me. The scientific landscape is constantly evolving. How do you stay updated with the latest advancements and ensure that your knowledge and skills remain at the forefront of your field? Well, I think um, I would say like the easy answer is reading papers, but then we know that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it takes a lot of time. So I think uh, the, the scientific conference, the research conferences are very important. And, um, and I, what I try to do is just to look at the program beforehand and make a plan of which talks uh, I might find interesting. How can I, like I make my schedule, I, I'm very organized. So then I made my schedule for the talks I want to attend. And, uh, and if not, now with the hybrid conferences is very good because then you can watch uh, the talk if you have missed it. Um, so I think the, the research conferences and these mostly the also the small meetings in which we, you can network with other people and share your ideas are very, very important as well. What advice would you perhaps specifically have for other women or girls considering a career in science? Well, just, um, I would say, don't, don't be afraid of, of, of uh, speaking out loud because you, you, are, you are as valid as anyone else and, and you're as good as, as anyone else. 
So just stand for yourself. And last one, um, as a mentor, what qualities do you believe are essential for young scientists to cultivate in order to succeed in their respective fields? Well, I think just uh, being always uh, questioning things, like be having this kind of uh, la, this kind of uh, starve for knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, just having the this, this spark always and trying to find new things and trying to question everything. I think I, I question too much everything, uh, <laughs> but I think it's also good as well because then you look a lot of, for a lot of information, you read a lot of papers, you contrast different things, and then you discuss with people and you get their ideas. So it's very nice. <laughs> So let me recap on the main takeaways. Um, Aitana has had an incredibly exciting and productive career so far. And I guess with that comes a lot of wisdom and insights um, that she kindly shared with us. And so for me, I think some of my main takeaways from uh, what the conversation we just had is to be open to trying out different things. Um, Be honest when you're Um, working with other people or collaborating um, to make sure that they know what it is that you want to do and what it is that you can offer and um, what you hope to get out of any projects that um, you end up collaborating with um, other labs. Um, Another thing that I learned is that um, you should um, have a lot of confidence because you, especially when you're talking about your project, Um, you know it better than anyone else in the room. And so you should have a lot of confidence when you're presenting it, not just in front of, you know, your lab team, um, external collaborators, but also in front of the the general public. Um, Yes, to have that confidence is really important. Um, And then when it comes to looking after yourself um, outside of the lab, it's important to, to listen to your body and to also make time for the important things in life because, um, yeah, I guess there's more to life than your research career, even though it is really important. It's good to have that balance. Um, and I guess the last thing is to not be afraid of speaking up, especially as a, a young woman in science. I think that's also a really good um, thing that you mentioned today. So we're now in the last segment of the show. And before we finish, uh, we just want to talk a little bit about mentoring. So Aitana, why did you decide to be a mentor? And what advice would you have for anyone listening who doesn't have a mentor? Well, I decided to be a mentor because I I never had one before Mm -hmm. when I was doing my PhD or when I was at my research assistant uh, uh, post. And I think I will have benefited very much from 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 having a mentor. Um, and uh, I just wanted to kind of help people from my experience. Uh, I had very good and very bad experiences in my career so far. So I just wanted to be there uh, for for just providing that support. Um, I think the, a mentoring scheme or having a mentor is very important. I think it's it's very valuable. It gives you another point of view, um, mm-hmm. which is sometimes out of your lab. Um, if you need any advice with your colleagues, your mentor won't know them. So it will be an honest and unbiased uh, advice or, um, or just uh, another point of view on, the, on your career or maybe things that you haven't thought about, um, something that has happened uh, to your mentor might happen to you and and then you will know what to do or, or how to better approach that. Um, so I definitely, I, I recommend 100% getting involved in a mentoring scheme. Yeah, definitely. Um, before I, I ask the next question, I just want to say that you've been an incredible mentor so far. <laughs> Thank I you. So much from you um, already. And I, I mean, I can't wait to start my PhD in October. <laughs> Um, taking in all the advice that you have given me. Um, (laughs) So the next question is, do you think your mentor has to come from the same field as you? Well, I think it depends on on which mentoring uh, you you are involved in. 
So, uh, uh, for example, in Race Against Dementia, I have a lovely mentor, and and uh, she's from a different uh, field. Uh, she doesn't work in dementia, but but she's very valuable. I, I, the sessions I have with her are very useful in terms of progression of my career. She was at a university, so in terms of uh, dealing with uh, with the issues in the team, general issues or or problems that can raise up from coordinating a team or supervising students. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it depends a lot on on what uh, you are looking from from a mentor. Um, so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Um, do you think it's a good idea to have multiple mentors at the same time, maybe supporting you in different ways? Yes, I I, I, I think it's a good idea. I, I, I think it's important not to overwhelm yourself with mentors uh, because then uh, you can have kind of a, a lot of information, a lot of different ideas. But I, I think it's definitely um, a good thing because the, they can provide you different point of views and depending on what you want to to discuss with them um yeah i think it's it's useful to have more than one mentor if you can last question and it's a fun one if you could choose anyone from history alive or dead to be your mentor who would you choose well that's a, also a difficult question and uh i'm gonna sound as a kind of a cliche but I'm really into the life of this person right now. I'm reading a book uh, uh, written by a Spanish writer, um, and uh, and uh, it's about the diaries of these scientists and his Marie Curie, and I find it so fascinating. Um, and uh, I really just would like to have a conversation with with her and, and learn about her life and and all the things that she had to to go through. So it's really really fascinating um it's funny that you mentioned her because she was also on my mind <laughs> oh really <laughs> <laughs>well that is all we have time for today i would like to thank my amazing mentor and guest dr aitana sogorba esteve um, if you would like to find out more about aitana you will find her bio and some previous contributions to podcasts on the dementia researcher website Thank you again, Aitana. Thank you very much for having me. This is the last episode of this season's Ask Your Mentor podcast, but the show will be back soon with a new series of mentees interviewing their mentors. I'm Shania Obara, and you have been listening to the Ask Your Mentor podcast from Dementia Researcher in association with Alzheimer's Research UK. Bye. Bye. Bye.